Hi, everybody. I'm glad for the chance to talk with you in our first FaithBridge family gathering that we're going to have, I predict, a lot of in the days ahead. The goal is we're thinking that about four times a week, we would like to have a chance to talk with you as faith bridgers, you can watch as a family or however it is that, that best is received by you. Um, just to have sort of a pastoral conversation. Another time it'll be some worship time, just some singing, just to put our eyes upwards and focused on the Lord. Uh, another time it'll be somebody else on our staff maybe saying, here's a good way to have family devotions if you want some tips on that. And just to try to, to uh, keep the connection going throughout the week and even to put tools in your toolbox as we journey through this unique era that we're in right now. Um, and then of course, we'll continue to worship that way. Somebody was asking, do you think we'll be in church again on Sunday? And I said, nah, I don't think so. Uh, when do you think we'll be back? Quick as we can, slow as we must. But um, we really don't know at this point, and we suspect it's gonna be a while. I'll tell you one reason that I think it's gonna be a while. Um, I can assure you it has nothing to do with uh, the uh, stock and trade uh, <laughs> talking points of MSNBC or CNN or Fox News. It has to do with one of the organizations on uh, the board of which I sit, and that's the Methodist Hospital at Willowbrook. And subsequently, I, I'm hearing all of this uh, medical speak and science in these phone conferences that I'm uh, on and listening to and with doctors and talking about surge points and, and all of this. And then over here, of course, I'm a pastor and I'm dealing with faith and scripture. And, and so I'm saying, Lord, how do I bring this together? What I'd like to do for just a few minutes right now is to try to help you look at this season that we're in the way that I'm trying to look at it, okay? So uh, let me just say, in case some of my sheep, and I love all of my sheep, we got a big flock, um, are still sort of holding on to the hope that this is just sort of a passing thing, it's gonna be gone here in a, in a few days, um, or maybe it's uh, a political maneuver during this election year or any of these sorts of things. Um, that's not the situation. And uh, because realistically, friends, the needle has uh, moved. And I think we'll do well not even to think of this as a Hurricane Harvey. Uh, because, you know, Hurricane Harvey, for, for many of us, it was kind of like a rough week or two. Those of you who took water, it was a rough six months or a year. Um, it's probably going to be kind of like a succession of Hurricane Harveys that are just going to be like, bam, bam, bam. This is kind of what I'm, I'm hearing, and, and let me see if I can help you understand why that is uh, in a way that was helpful for me, borrowing uh, the writings of, of another person that I read that, that put it into sort of a form of a matrix. Follow me here. Um, this is why we have a problem. Every single person who has coronavirus will likely spread it to a minimum of three out of the 20 people on average that they come in contact with every day. Now you add those three to the one, the original, that's four. So the next day, if that was Sunday, the next day, Monday, now those three plus that original one, those four will spread it to 12. Okay, keep doing the math those original ones with the new ones by Tuesday become 16 and they spread it to 48. On Wednesday, those 64 spread it to 192. On Thursday, those 256 spread it to 768. The next day, Friday, those 1,024 spread it to 3,072. On Saturday, those 4,096 spread it to 12,288 people. And one week later, the next Sunday, that's just one week, 
those 16,384 people infect 49,152. So it's very possible that the two people who were originally identified as uh, carriers of COVID-19 uh, as they were going throughout Houston's livestock uh, show and rodeo last week or week before, it's very likely that with their exposures before they were diagnosed and quarantined could multiply to 98,304 people in just two weeks, okay? That's why we're talking about this, what public, official, public health officials desperately, desperately, desperately need us to understand is that while Texas may only be dealing with, I think today it's 70 something number, but yesterday it was 50 something, 70 something, um, that the multiplication, if something doesn't happen very quickly, is going to just continue to shoot way up. We'll pass 1,000, we'll pass 2,000, we'll pass 3,000 in just a few days. And, uh, because the people who have COVID-19 are passing it before they're feeling the, the symptoms. And uh, so China in Italy, for example, enacted social distancing measures, but they did it one week too late. So there was all this much more uh, multiplying exponential, uh, I said it backwards, exponential multiplication that happened before they uh, froze things and said, don't move, stay where you are. Um, and so here's the way the Warline family is looking at it. Um, we figure one of us may very well already be carriers. Okay, the chances of that are probably high. Um, if for no other reason, one of our boys was at the rodeo last week all day with his friends. And um, remember, <laughs> We're sick before we're symptomatic. And so it's entirely possible to be a spreader for days without uh, knowing it. Therefore, let's go spiritual, let's go biblical. The most immediate way that we can love our neighbors as ourselves is to stay home. Now, I want you to look at that spiritually, not as government speak, as you're taking away our freedom, not as not as you you lack faith. I got a letter or two last week. Can it, Pastor Ken, you're, you're Pastor Ken, you're losing your faith by canceling church. I'm like, oh no 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 no, you're not understanding the gravity of the situation. I, I'm I sit on a hospital board. I'm listening to this. I'm hearing them talk about surge point and what are we going to do with the patients if we hit surge point and we surpass surge point and there's no more space. Then what do we do? And what do we do if all the hospitals? I mean, I, this is this is just the reality. And so the best way that we can love our neighbor as ourselves right now, brothers and sisters, is to stay home. They call it social distancing. If you have to go out, and have to is the key word, have to go out, then you practice social distancing with the six feet rule, where you, you're not even touching and, and blowing on each other, and any, any transfer of anything is, is happening. This is the way that we can love our neighbors as ourselves. Why do we wanna do that? Because we want to push that curve down, stop the escalation, so that the virus will die out with the smallest radius of a circle uh, and not keep expanding. That's why it's very, very important. And we who love Jesus should be the first people who are saying, hey, what did he talk about? He said about, he talked about dying to ourselves, being a servant of all. We who love Jesus, we're not people who go around and say, hey, let me tell you about my rights. And let me tell that's not who we are as, as followers of Jesus. We're people who say, no, I lay down my life for others. If, if this could help, then I'll just stay put. I'll just work from home. I'll telecommute. Um, if I have to go out, I'll do the six feet rule. Um, because why? Because we love the Lord and because we love our, our neighbors as 
ourselves. So here's the reality. You and I, we can't stop the virus as faith bridgers. And as faith bridgers, we're not attempting to stop the virus. We're simply trying to slow it down. That's what we're trying to do is just slow it down so that the hospital facilities uh, and all of the nurses and doctors aren't overrun so they don't hit that surge point beyond which they can't help people when there's more and more patients coming in uh, who might need the help. Um, so those are just some, some uh, thoughts. You say, well, that's, that's kind of sobering. Well, it is, but it's probably good to just deal with the truth because if you know the truth, the truth can set you free. So let's come around the corner and say, okay, so what do you do? What, Pastor Ken, you said you're gonna talk about what you're doing, what the Werlein family, okay, so let me talk about what, what we're doing. What, what will help this situation? I think what will help is a lot of planning and a lot of prayer. Because I am convinced, friends, that if we would plan well and if we would pray much, God would use this season as a season of revival in the American church. Follow me here. For years, we who work in this church and many churches, a lot of my church pastor friends say, you know, I've got this person, that person, this family, they're wonderful. I love them, love them, love them. And I wanna help them grow in their discipleship and they wanna grow in their discipleship. They even say, I wanna learn how to have devotions and I wanna have family devotions. And, but I'm so busy, they're always so busy. They're busy, 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 and their kids are busy and they go to this and they participate in that and they do all these extracurricular things. And it just hit me a day or two ago for this congregation full of suburbanites that have always been so, so busy. <laughs> well, in a mere 48 hours like that, God has providentially seen fit to bring all of that to a screeching halt. Coronavirus has stripped us just overnight of sporting events. You can't watch NBA games. You can't watch any games. There's no new, ESPN's just showing old reruns of stuff, right? You can't watch new sporting events or late night comedy shows uh, or uh, schools. You can't go to school or the extracurricular events. And suburbanites, we busy suburbanites who've always lamented our busyness, God has given us an opportunity to be free of the busyness. This is an amazing opportunity. This is big. I see this as God giving us a chance, we Christians, we who love Jesus, to be a bright, shining light in a lost, spiritually dark, confused, hedonistic, selfish culture that isn't going to know what to do with themselves, isn't going to know how to care for themselves. And we can step in and say, hey, actually, I am a person who lives full of hope because Christ fills my heart and his spirit goes inside of me. And I actually have a little bandwidth. I actually have a little time. And you know, how could I help you? Even if it's just having a conversation at the doorway, we're gonna practice social distance. I'm not gonna come in and settle on your couch, but we never got to know each other very well. Yeah, could I pray for you? Uh, because I believe in prayer. and I've got some extra time, I'm doing more praying. <laughs> right now, you know, or maybe serving them. I think I mentioned that in the message yesterday. Uh, maybe, you know, especially elderly people or, or grandparent age people, especially if the kids are in a different city and can't care for them. Maybe they need you to run and get the groceries or arrange for the grocery electronically to come to their door so they can stay safe and get their pharmaceuticals and all the stuff that they need. I see this as an opportunity to do all sorts of things that we've never had the time to do in the name of of Jesus. And so I'm saying, okay, Lord, this is, this is a moment. We don't want to just snooze through this moment. Uh, it's, it's just like this blurry, vague memory where we watch the bazillion movies on Netflix, but where we really seized the moment and stepped into it. So I've been thinking about Nehemiah. You remember Nehemiah? And you can read his whole story in the Old Testament in the book of Nehemiah. It's a great read. You probably have some time. You can read the whole book. It's not that long, and it's a great story. And it's about this guy who uh, was the cup bearer to the king, Artaxerxes. The reason that Nehemiah uh, is a Jewish fella, is a Hebrew, 
who's over in an exile land, he's not in Jerusalem, is because years and years earlier, King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians had rolled through Jerusalem, had torched it, had destroyed it, had torn down its walls, and had kidnapped uh, all of the, the smartest and the brightest and the best Hebrews, and they carted them off to exile, and they tried to get them to intermarry so that they would forget their, their, their Jewishness um, and forget that they're the people of God, the chosen people, and so. Um, but those who were faithful, like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, they, they followed the letter of the law as best they could, but they always kept an eye first and foremost on their heavenly father. And they always remembered, but ultimately this is who I am um, in this foreign land. Well, several generations later, you have this guy named Nehemiah. He's never been to the Holy Land. He's never been to Jerusalem, but he hears about how Jerusalem still lies in ruin and there's no protective wall around the city. And in those days it was considered an embarrassment and pitiful if a city was a naked city and didn't have a protective wall going around it with, and those walls were thick. We're not talking about a little brick wall. We're talking about walls that they could have chariot races on top of. And so one day it says in Nehemiah 1 that he goes into the king, uh, Artaxerxes, as the cupbearer and his job was to drink the wine and eat the food to make sure there's no poison. And, and I guess it's a good day of work if he went home and survived the meal. And so that said to Artaxerxes, the food is safe. So he goes into Artaxerxes and Artaxerxes in a moment of uh, alertness or sensitivity says, Nehemiah, you, you seem a little downcast. What's wrong? And he says, well, I, I don't want to come across as downcast because I know our job is to try to make you feel good. If you really want to know, I'll tell you why. The reason why is because I've just heard all this terrible, terrible news about my homeland that I've never really been to, but I know it's my homeland because it's where my forefathers came from. And I've heard about what Jerusalem looks like. And it's just made me sad. And it says in, in uh, chapter one, verse four, that he sat down and he wept and he prayed and he had fasted. And that happened before he goes and has this conversation with uh, King Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes uh, says to him, huh, well, what do you want me to do? And Nehemiah has a plan. He was prepared. He says in chapter two, okay, well, if you're asking, here's what I would like if it could possibly please the king, if you would grant me safe passageway to take myself and a lot of people with me, I'd like to go back to a place we've never been. And I would like to have a lot of timber. If you would write a letter, they would, you, they would this guy who runs the forest, because we, we're gonna need a lot of timber to build this huge wall and have gates. And, and also I need a lot of gates and a lot of timber. And, um, and, and we'll need protection. If you could arrange for that, uh, King, that would be amazing. And the King's like, yeah, I can do all of that. So what do we, what do we see right there? Well, two things. Nehemiah was a purpose, uh, was, a, was a, a person of deep abiding faith. He, he was a person of prayer. First thing he did as he's weeping, he sat down and he just prayed, pours his heart out to God, says, oh God, fasted, comes to God. I think this is a season that we can be doing that as believers. You say, many of you have said, I would like to pray more. I'm just so busy. No, you're not busy. I'm not as busy as you used to be. You could set aside 10 or 15 minutes now. You could do it. You could actually develop a prayer journal where you actually keep some prayer requests and you go back and you look and you check them off and you say, look how God answered. And, um, where you have a little section that, that you are, are writing down your thanksgiving, the things for which you're thankful every day and or your confessions. Another section where you could write, Lord, I, I need to ask your forgiveness for these sorts of things. You could actually get a prayer journal going. And one day when we look back in the era of coronavirus, you could say, you know, that was the season I really started to grow spiritually. God used it for good. And, and so Nehemiah was this person of prayer. And then he was this person with a plan. He showed up with a plan. He was ready 
when he goes in and, he, and when he talks to Artaxerxes and, and, he, and he, he says, here's all the things that I need. And the king was benevolent to him. And he, and he said, yes, I, I will, I'll give those things to you. It's going to happen. You're going to be able to go and you can have those and, and, and you'll be able to build the wall back. And you can go on and read the rest of the story. It's quite a great story of how he gets that wall built in a remarkably short period of time. Well, it seems to me that we in this coronavirus era, we the church, the, the believers, the people who love Jesus, who are locking arms together, even though we're talking electronically, we're gonna have more Zoom meetings than we've probably ever had and other such formats, uh, we're practicing social distancing, but we're not practicing spiritual distancing. We're not shutting down ministry. No, in fact, my hope is that when the day comes, whenever it comes, that we're back in normal form, we're back in facilities and, and with the kids ministry and the youth ministry and everything happening locally at 18,000 student near airline. My prayer is that we will have even expanded and grown and strengthened during this season. I'll tell you a story. It's about a Korean pastor who years ago, uh, started a church and it was growing in South Korea, very, very strong. I, they, they passed 10,000 and 20,000. I think they were up around 70,000. And then he got, uh, I think he got tuberculosis, something terrible. And it, 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 it would take him out for the better part of two years, maybe three, as I recall the story. And, but, uh, pastor, what he did is he, he took a staff and he said, okay, I'm dividing you up into regions, into zones, and I want you to make sure that all of these people in each of your regions, in each of your zones, all around Seoul, Korea, are shepherded and cared for, are prayed for, are discipled, and are evangelizing and reaching out. And many people thought, this is gonna kill the church. Whenever he gets well, that church is gonna be, no, he got well and they had multiplied. And they now numbered something around 750,000 people. So there again, we see God can take all things and work them together for good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. I'm just believing that God is gonna take this season, if we'll step into it, if we'll seize it, if we'll be the people of God and, and start putting together plans and praying. So here in our office, we've already had several Zoom meetings and, and we're looking at every ministry and saying, okay, as they're working with their teams, what are you gonna to do to make sure that everybody is shepherded and cared for in this sort of frightening, strange time to make sure that they're growing in their discipleship and that small groups are still happening by Zoom or however we're gonna do that, um, and that they're evangelizing and reaching out into the community and their neighbors, social distancing, we're not, we gotta do that, but still serving those uh, in the name of Christ and, and, and sharing the good news of Jesus with those who need hope in this era. So that's, that's some of how we are uh, looking at it. So let me just uh, say one last thing of a personal pastoral, uh, nature. The war lines are navigating the same confusion that you're navigating. So yesterday after church, we had some family time, had some prayer time, said, okay, now it's time for us to come up with a plan. We've got to have a plan uh, because nobody does well if we don't have a plan. Nobody does well if we don't have a routine. And so we got out the butcher paper and we just said, okay, on Monday, we're getting up at this time. We're gonna have breakfast. We're gonna have family devotions. We're in the Gospel of Matthew, actually, because we started that before we started doing the Gospel of Mark at church. And so today we were in Matthew 21, and we had devotions together and talked about what does that mean and how do we apply that in our lives. And, and then we have like PE exercise, uh, and the boys decided they're gonna do, do basketball because uh, they love that. And Suzanne takes a walk, and I'm a, an elliptical machine uh, kind of person. And, um, and then we start school hours. 
And like from, I don't know, 10 or so, I think it was till to, to noon, it's two hours of school. They were getting the assignments done that are coming to us electronically. And uh, they're having lunch. I can't join them during this part because I'm doing all this other stuff. And then back for more school stuff from one to three. And then one of the boys has Boy Scout goals that he's he still wants to keep working. So he's working on that. And we're leaning into chores and figuring, you know, we've been sort of hit or miss. Some seasons we're doing pretty well. Other seasons we're like, we're so busy. We don't have time. We'll just get it done somehow. We're like, this is a great season to teach you boys how to live independently. You got to learn it, learn it sooner or later. How about sooner? And so we're working on even just basic, how do you keep a house and how do you cook food and how do you do that kind of stuff? And then some family time in the evening. And I'm going to encourage you at the most foundational level, start there with your family, step in, start giving directional leadership and spiritual leadership. We're going to be doing that from the church as well, talking to you along the way, trying to resource you. And my hope and my prayer is that, like I said, when we get through this coronavirus, and we will get through this coronavirus sooner or later, that we will have actually had more people who became faith bridgers because of the way that we seized the moment for Jesus. That's my big hope and that's my big prayer. Let's pray now. Lord, I do pray for uh, everybody who's watching and listening. I pray for families, I pray for single people, I pray for our elderly, extra protection. I pray for um, businesses, small business owners who I, I'm getting the prayer requests, I see them, I'm feeling their fear uh, and I get it. And Lord, I'm lifting them up, I'm just praying God, sustain them, bring your comfort to them, Jesus. Um, I pray God that you're going to use this season. It is not a season that any of us saw coming. Even up through the middle of last week, I was still a naysayer about it and you know that well, Lord. But then I had to step into this reality and by the day, more and more of us are stepping in and, and saying, okay, this is what we signed up for, but this is where we are. So what do we do with this? Lord, help us as the believers, as the followers of Jesus to shine with a brightness, a spiritual light into our neighborhoods, into our communities, starting with our families that has never been so bright and hope giving that other people will be drawn to us, not really just to us though, really through us to you, Jesus, because ultimately you're the one who gives us hope and sustenance and strength and provides for us in our times of need. So I'm asking for all of that in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Well, again, we'll talk to you more uh, probably four times uh, a week, right about this time in the evening, and then on Sundays as well, as long as it's good for us to love our neighbors as ourselves with some social distancing. Go in peace. We'll talk to you soon.